Um, so some of you may know me, some of you might not. Uh, my name's Death Veggie. I'm the Minister of Propaganda for the Cult of the Dead Cow. Uh, this is my, I don't know how many DEF CONs, but the first one was DEF CON 3, so we've been around for a little bit for that. So uh, the reason I, I propose this panel is uh, 2024 is the 40th anniversary of a lot of sort of like benchmarks in the computer underground and the hacking thing. So it's, it's 1984 is when Cult of the Dead Cow was founded. It's when 2600 Magazine was founded. It's when the Legion of Doom was founded, um, as well as I think uh, Chaos Computer Club was founded. Um, so you want to do something to kind of talk about that early hacker history. So, you know, this panel is really going to kind of focus on the 80s and early 90s because that's when we are from. And I think it's kind of something that the stories are, are sort of underrepresented in the history just because, you know, that this was a time when it really was underground and, and sort of it's not, you know, at that time sort of um, hacker was a dirty word. It was, you know, synonymous with, with criminal in the, uh, in, in the press, et cetera. So I've tried to get together uh, a group of people from um, various different groups, including uh, CDC and LOD, Eric uh, Emmanuel Goldstein of 2600, um, uh, MOD, which, you know, it's, it's pretty, pretty exciting to get, <laughs> to, get, to get John Thread in here as well as Tommy D. Cat, who's been around. And the panel will be moderated by Professor uh, Shire from Notre Dame, who uh, wrote a book, uh, A History of Fake Things on the Internet, available at fine bookstores everywhere, um, that came out in December. Um, so I'm going to let him take the, take the mic and do the, the proper introductions, I guess. Can we get, let's get everybody on stage. Okay. Does anybody want to come up and take, take your seats? <laughs> oh, you, you can know, they're hiding in the back. I don't know what's going on here. Woo! Let's give it up for the old school hackers. One more seat here, and then we got right there. Oh no, we got we got three here and three there. So there's. Oh, you have seven people. I was thinking. Yeah, I I can count. Counting. <laughs> Math. All right, let's jump into this. Um, welcome everybody. I think Death Veggie did a phenomenal job introducing what this panel is all about. Uh, I'm sorry to interrupt. Oh. So your talk is not on the monitor. Uh oh. Oh no. And we want to fix that. Okay. okay. The tech, so the tech support to crew is going to pause us. Talk amongst yourselves. Oh, yeah. I can Everyone, give you a topic. Take a break. <laughs> you know the the late Byzantine Empire. How how much of the you know the late Roman Empire did it carried over, and ha versus how much of the Greek? So so please you know oh, speak amongst yourselves. <laughs> it's like a commercial break. A commercial break, yeah. Right. What are we advertising? I don't know. The network didn't tell us. <laughs> Probably ham. Mm. Just delicious ham. It's made of pigs. <laughs> spam, spam, spam. I'm going to tell them the real AV techs might be on stage. Uh, we're still, they're still sorting out the AV stuff. What do you mean the real AV techs? Uh, they're antivirus techs. They come <laughs> from CrowdStrike. <laughs> A question. Um, <laughs> how vetted are these people? <laughs> There's a reason that we didn't bring our laptops. <laughs> Classic. I mean, we could do... Well, I guess there's 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 uh, media to go or, or, uh, around with our introductions. Um, is this going to be on the blooper reel, or is this going to be on the? I don't know. I mean, maybe we should jump into the other stuff while they're still sorting that out, just because we've only got a limited amount of time. Yeah, yeah, we don't want to. Yeah, reel. let's let's get into this. Woo! Let's do it. Okay. Sorry to cut off the, the, st <laughs> the stimulating conversations about the Byzantine Empire. You can take that. Maybe there will be a breakout room afterwards. All right. Hello, everybody. I am Walter Shire, a professor at the University of Notre Dame. Um, and I have a really fun job because I get to hang out with hackers. I get to study the history of hacking, which is a fascinating topic. And I think we're all here because we want to learn something about it. Yes. Yeah, there we go. Got it. Woo. We got the AV working right here. Yeah. <laughs> Oh, no, no, it's just on. The it's, I know, it's on his screen. Woo. Okay. Everybody brought their opera glasses, right? Sorry. <laughs> wow. All right, we're just going to keep going because this could take the rest of the panel uh, to debug. Um, a big part of my life as a technologist has been inspired by the six folks who are up on this stage. Uh, and I thought it would be really fun to just be in conversation with them, uh, to try to understand where all this came from how it has brought us here to this moment at DEF CON 
and probably our private lives, our professional careers, social lives, right, is, is all wrapped up in hacking, right? We love this stuff. And where is it all going? Can the past really help us understand where technology is going and perhaps fix a lot of the annoying problems out there on the internet uh, that we're all sort of concerned about? So I think it's gonna be a really fun panel. And to begin, let's just jump in and do our introduction. So I'm gonna start all the way here on my left with X. So everybody, just, I want to know your origin story. Right? Let the audience know how you got into this um, and where is it gone in your own life. Is the mic good? Yeah. yeah. All right. Um, so I was from, I'm from Oak Ridge, Tennessee, uh, in East Tennessee. That's, there was a city created to basically do the nuclear testing that, to build the atomic bomb. So the city was created. There's three or four, there's a national lab, uh, three or four other labs, and my father was a, uh, computer technician at one of the national security complexes. So most of the city, uh, everybody I grew up with, their, their parents were in, in the government. Got it? Yes! Excellent. <laughs> Woo! Thank you. Thank you very much to, to everybody who's endeavored. Yeah, so everybody I grew up with, their, their parents were working for the national security complexes, um, the national lab. So everybody, there was a lot of smart people that I grew up with in high school. So um, my dad brought home a computer in 1985. It was a compact luggable. It was about 30 pounds with the, the tiny little seven inch screen and the fold out keyboard. I still have it in my attic. Uh, it does not work. It needs a new power supply. Um, two floppy disks, no hard drive. Um, so my dad brought it home with a Hayes 1200 baud smart mode and maybe so he could do non-security non work at home, non-confidential non work at home. Um, so he, he did give me access to it. I, I didn't know what to do with the modem. You know, he taught me basic. Uh, so I would play games and, you know, control break out of the basic. finest language. Yeah. <laughs> you know, con control break out of games to see what the code is doing. Um, that's almost the extent of my programming uh, ability. But um, so before I was old enough to drive, I used to ride my bike down to Radio Shack, which was a couple blocks away, and just hang out at Radio Shack with a couple of older guys who were computer guys into the bulletin board scene and stuff. And so they finally probably got annoyed with me being there. Um, they, gave, they gave me a number to call. I called and got into the bulletin board scene. Um, I was in love with the idea of being a hacker after seeing war games, um, but I, I had no, no, no way to get there. Um, I'll make it a little bit shorter. I finally found a bulletin board where I was on enough that somebody gave me access to the secret section. Codes and wares. Uh, mostly wares, but um, there were frack magazine copies in there. And once I started reading those, I was, I was in love with the idea of I wanted to be this. I wanted to be a hacker. I wanted to, uh, to, to learn what they were talking about. Um, how much time are we getting? the introductions. Keep going, keep going. Okay. So uh, then, you know, graduated high school. I uh, started college at the University of Tennessee in Chattanooga, where I got my first Unix account. They gave all the students Unix accounts um, for email. Um, and from reading and seeing what people were doing, I saw that several people were using IRC. I got on IRC. I joined Pound Wares because I was, I was in... I wanted to play games for free, basically. I, Tommy D. Cat was on there. Um, a, a, a who is of him, he was on Pound Hack, joined Pound Hack, and met uh, some of the best friends I've had in my life. Aww. Thanks. Before you go, I, I want to ask, like, a, I would like to take a picture of the crowd, so I'm going to do that. Anybody who doesn't, you know, who Look, doesn't want your face. to be in it, like, Blur, yeah, blur your face, just in li live. So th thank you very much. I'm going to take one from this side and one from that side. Thank you. <laughs> All right. Manuel, you're up next. Hey, um, well, I'm Manuel Goldstein. Um, a pen name that I coined 40 years ago, 1984, a name that's from the book 1984. There's a lot of synchronicity here that kind of scares me, actually, because <laughs> I don't understand how it all happens so so um, um, in in tune. 
Um, but yeah, 1984 was when Emmanuel Goldstein technically was born as a handle. Um, but my um, interest in technology started, I, well, I mean, I've always been interested in technology. It, however, limited I had access to, grew up in a one-parent household. We never had much, but, you know, we had a phone, and I would play around with the phone all the time, rotary dial phone. Uh, people know what rotary dial phones are. Okay, good, okay. <laughs> Sometimes I talk to crowds, and they have no idea what I'm talking about. Um, if you ever want to have some fun, get some teenagers, tell them to dial a number on a rotary phone. They don't, they don't know how, to, <laughs> how far they're supposed to go with their finger. They don't know if they're supposed to push it. They don't know if they're supposed to lift up the receiver. It's, it's a lot of fun. Um, but yeah, so that was my, um, the extent of my um, uh, uh, access to technology until my senior year of high school when I heard this, this sound coming from this room uh, that had computer uh, class in it. Um, Somebody it, was strangling a dolphin? Well, it was just a weird, like, kind of high-pitched noise. Turned out it was um, uh, deck riders, uh, 300 baud deck riders, high-speed deck riders. Um, they were connected to um, uh, a computer system that the entire school district was connected to far away, uh, and all these people were typing away. I was fascinated by it, you know, that you could type something and something would type back at you. Uh, that was new. That was, that was alien. And... Uh, my high school, Ward Melville High School in, in Setauket, New York, um, we had these deck riders that other school districts didn't have. They had shitty 110 baud connections. We had the 300 baud connection. Um, and so, you know, I just got more and more interested in that and uh, started playing around. I never took a course. To this day, I still have never taken a computer course, um, and, which is weird. Um, but um, basically, uh, I'd stay after school, and that's when the games would open up. I'd play Star Trek and Wumpus and all kinds of fun things like that. Um, and uh, basically that led to my interest in college, went to the State University of New York at Stony Brook, uh, and um, well, I can tell the story later about how I got the FBI to raid them, but that's, that's, <laughs> that's going to take longer than a couple of minutes. But basically, um, uh, Stony Brook was a place where I was able to um, uh, meet like-minded people, uh, expand uh, my mind in, in many ways. Uh, but mostly in, in just learning and being exposed to different uh, perspectives. Um, and I was an English major in a school that's mostly known for engineering. Uh, so that kind of set me apart. I like to write. I like to um, uh, collate, worked for the uh, campus, two campus newspapers. Um, but it was the BBS scene um, when um, I had access to a modem. Um, well, I should, I should explain. I worked for the campus radio station. Our chief engineer bought an H89, Heathkit H89, uh, and um, we used that to connect to BBSs, and I found those to be fascinating. Uh, bulletin board systems were these, these methods of just connecting to people all throughout the country. Uh, you could only have one person on at a time, so m most of the time it was dealing with busy signals and waiting for them to go away so you could connect. And I think we were up to 1,200 baud at that time. Uh, and by connecting to all these different bulletin boards, I was able to make friends all over the place. Um, how I was able to connect to long distance ones is also a different story. Um, but basically, I, the, the hacker and, and, and freak, phone freak bulletin boards had these great stories, amazing stories. Um, and I wanted to share those stories. I wanted other people to read them because they were just so amazing about people going to their central office to trash and get printouts and uh, log in to the Cosmo system and, and, and just all kinds of hacker adventures that I just knew the public would appreciate if presented in, in the right manner. Because believe it or not, back then, in uh, the early to mid 80s, hackers were being demonized. Yeah, imagine that. <laughs> Um, so people had a, a, a misconception, and I figured all they had to do was hear some stories, and maybe they would they would see another um, uh, aspect to them. Well, obviously that didn't happen, uh, but we did get a whole lot more hackers, <laughs> a whole lot more people that wanted in on this on this magical world. Uh, that's basically how the idea for 2600 got started. Uh, what if we print this out <laughs> and 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 mail it to people? Let's see if that works. And basically, uh, we posted some, some um, um, uh, uh, I guess, uh, files, uh, G files, or um, announcements on bulletin boards. Um, send us an envelope, and we'll send you an, a, a, an issue of a magazine in January of 1984. And that's how the first issue went out, to a bunch of people that just sent us an envelope. Uh, and um, uh, the rest is pretty much history, but that's how it started.
I think, uh, you know, I started out um, kind of similar to, to X in some ways, but although earlier, uh, you know, I had a dad that had worked in the computer industry uh, and a mom who had been, you know, worked in a computer lab in the 70s. And as a kid, I remember, you know, going and playing at the computer lab and with, the, with the punch cards and stuff. But, you know, we got a computer in 1980, like a, a, my dad built one from a kit, a Sinclair ZX80. And similar to X, like, you know, I was uh, working in basic, typing in stuff like that. Anyway, fast forward to like kind of the mid 80s, my dad brought home a modem. You know, I wasn't really doing anything with it at that time, maybe calling a couple, you know, uh, uh, my friend's local board. Um, in 1986, uh, my family went on a vacation to uh, California. To I grew up outside of Boston. Um, and uh, to visit my cousins who had, were in Silicon Valley. And they, they sent me home with a, with a, a floppy disk that was full of text files. So it's 1986, this, this uh, disk had Cult of the Dead Cow files on it. It had Frack Magazine number three. It had files from a group called um, Anarchy Inc. It had, um, I think, uh, one of the LOD technical journals, et cetera. And it sort of was like, oh man, there's this all this other cool stuff going out there. And I started to call other BBSs. Um, you know, they would have a list of numbers at the bottom. So I'd, I'd start calling BBSs in other parts of the country, talking to people. And I realized that, you know, I, I, had, I was growing up in like this like a relatively small, relatively conservative town in the outskirts of Boston where I was the weird kid. And like, so being on BBS is like, oh, holy shit, there are other people like me out there. And it's what, you know, my grandmother used to affectionately refer to as smarty weirdos. She's like, you and your friends are smarty weirdos. It's like, which I, I think is fair, you know, she didn't have the language for neuroatypical, but. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, uh, you know, I called these things, meeting people all over, learning stuff, and then there was the day that my parents got a $600 phone bill. <laughs> and, um, ah, right there. yeah, they sat me down, and my dad was like, this will not happen again. And I was like, okay, well, I'm not going to stop talking to my friends in Sweden, so uh, how do I do this for free? And, you know, so that led into, like, learning how to make, you know, phone, phone calls for free, either, you know, uh, war dialing, uh, sorry, codes or war dialing locally, and I love to find what we call the global outdial modems, which was basically businesses for their own people would have like, okay, you dial in a local number, then there's just a modem that will allow you to call anywhere. And a lot of times these had no security on them at all because there wasn't really a concept of that at the time, or it was just like a default password or something like that. So then I could call whatever I want with no, <laughs> never get a bill. Um, in the, you know, I, I also started working with, uh, you know, talking to other people like into the cult of the dead cow. I was eventually invited in because I was uh, um, setting up uh, alliance teleconferences, which were just, it was teleconferencing. But at that time, teleconferencing cost like multiple dollars a minute. Like, and so, so I was just setting these up for free on hacked accounts. Sorry, I mean, allegedly setting these up for free on allegedly hacked accounts. In 40 years, man. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> and uh, eventually they uh, invited me to join. And I guess, you know, somehow that was over 30 years ago. Time is fucking weird. <laughs> um, but yeah, I don't know. So. Patrick. Cool. All right. My, uh, my, my introduction to computers sort of happened in uh, the late 70s. My father was a physicist who was working at the National Center for Atmospheric Research. And they had one of the first Cray supercomputers. And uh, back then it was really exciting. It had its own room, this cooling system all around it. It looked kind of like an orange hexagon-shaped tower. And uh, my, my father uh, taught me to program this incredible language called Fortran 77 that you'd feed it on punch cards. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, th that that led subsequently to to me getting an Apple II, no plus, and you could get the 16k RAM card, and get, you know solder in a shift key mod, so you had lowercase on it, and uh, you know it, it, it was amazing stuff. And then uh, after that was, I think came out with the 5.25 inch disc drive, so you didn't have to use cassette tape anymore to store things. And in the very beginning, uh, there were like these different gatherings of neuroatypical individuals who had gathered together Smarty weirdos. <laughs> to play with, uh, play with computers. And uh, it was in person, and that eventually led to 
uh, being online and coming in contact with more people. And there was the, the piracy scene of getting software because it's like, well, I'm, I'm a kid. I, I don't have like all this crazy money to buy this software I'm not really going to use. And what it turned into was the, the most interesting thing about 99% of all software, other than collecting it, because you've got them all, is very important, especially if they're zero day old wares. Um, but uh, it, it was just like the protection scheme. What, what did you guys do and pour into this to try to prevent people from copying it? And then all of that went online with modems at the lightning fast speed of like 300 baud, which uh, you know, increased exponentially. And as has been mentioned, I got like my mom got her first like two thousand dollar phone bill, and it's just what the fuck is this? <laughs> it's like, well, I, I'm not going to stop calling my friends uh, all over the world. <laughs> so, how does the phone system work exactly, and how are all these things connected? Which led to an interest in in freaking, and by that time. Uh, I was living in New York City, hanging out on the Lower East Side, and uh, there was this thing called Youth International Party Lines, which was actually started by, uh, you know, one of the people was Abby Hoffman. It was the whole countercultural movement. It was left of the left back then, <laughs> and uh, it metamorphosed into TAP, and there were the TAP meetings on the Lower East Side, and uh, we got together and did a lot of interesting things with uh, the phone company computers because they really had a, a fascinating network. I mean, Cosmos is, you know, Unix in uppercase and it has a lot of undocumented <laughs> commands that you're not supposed to know about. <laughs> and uh, that whole culture of being online and connecting with people uh, sort of led to the formation of these groups who would work together. And that, that was the beginning of, uh, well, LOD. Uh, there was a previous group called Knights of Shadow that kind of self-destructed. And uh, there, there's this person who may even be here somewhere at this conference, I don't know, who, who, who's the founder of the Legion of Doom. And uh, we, we, we basically <laughs> got, <laughs> we, we basically, you got together people who were good at different skill sets. There was the people who were good with the phone systems, people who were good at hacking and actual coding and programming, and the social engineers. And together, you would all pull your talents together to cause greater chaos than you could by yourself. <laughs> and, uh, so th that that was, uh, you know, the 80s in, in, into... The, the very early 90s where uh, my, my friend and uh, an, another person from LOD, uh, Bruce Fancher and I started MindVox. And MindVox was the first internet access provider in New York City. This was, uh, we started the company in 1991, we went live in 1992, and suddenly everybody on earth had to get on this thing called the internet. And that was, uh, it was a tremendous amount of fun. It was complete chaos. And I'm very grateful to have uh, lived through uh, this timeline that most of us sitting here right now share. Thank you very much. Tommy DeCat, you are up next. Yeah. Hello, DEF CON. Hey. Hello, Tommy. Hey. Been coming here for a while. Uh, let me uh, give you a little background. Does it? Uh, it's not too different from a couple of the the people over there. I guess uh, Walter, you kind of describe us as the new wave coming into the the scene. Um, 1983. I was 13 years old, and uh, I, I had a Commodore 64 at that time. I kind of liked games, uh, and my dad got a modem. So the, the problem was that modem wasn't for a Commodore 64. It was for a CPM-based system. So basically, I needed to, to learn how to control that modem. And in in, in, in basically, on the CDN, CPM system, I had to reverse engineer the drivers on that to, to write my own bulletin board software so I could uh, get people to call me to get me wares, right? Um, eventually, I did get, get a modem for that Commodore 64. Um, but also, you know, I wanted more games for that. So 
what I found the, the, the currency for getting games, uh, you could get codes too. You could, uh, you could call long distance for free. There's all kinds of neat things you could get to. So I kind of discovered the world of uh, freaking, I guess. Uh, you could call me a, a, a code kitty at that point for uh, whatnot. But, uh, you know, as, as I started learning about uh, access to things, you know, that, that became kind of addicting. Uh, there were toys out there that I wanted to get into. There were games out there, but mostly I, I started to learn about other computers, other systems, and it just kind of started uh, creating a, a, a bit of a thirst for knowledge. So uh, a lot of the things we did back in the day, I, I would say is, is uh, geared at getting access to these things. I mean, I'm wearing this little thing that uh, you know, emulates a system that came out in 2001 that plays games so much cooler than, you know, all the, the hoops I, I jumped through to get the games for the system I had at that time. But uh, as, as, you know, reaching out and in, in, uh, finding people out there kind of similar to me, I, I discovered there were communities or, you know, you didn't have to go at this alone. So uh, reaching out to the, the bulletin board systems in the area, uh, I, I discovered, I think it was a metal shop uh, was one of the first metal shop AE. Uh, yeah, yeah, one of the first uh, big boards I got into and started learning about the scene, and that's where I learned uh, a lot of those uh, kids met up uh, at this place. Uh, I, I lived in the Midwest at the time, and there's a, a gallery and mall in St. Louis that they had what they call 2,600 meetings. So <laughs> I started showing up there, met some like-minded folks, traded games and whatnot, and they started telling me, "Well, you know, this is actually about this magazine." So that, that's kind of where. I, I saw a, a manual's work uh, come in, in there, and that, that started lighting a path, you know? So it, it's all about the access, and I started reading about other people who did things, you know? Maybe it's not the most I exquisite stuff uh, or hacks, but people are, are showing that they're curious about things. So that really engaged my interest. Uh, I started uh, talking to, uh, there's a, a guy, Sigmund Uckgaard, uh, who had a, Rosetta News was a bookstore, and he said, you know, if you like that magazine, maybe you'll want to take a look, look at this uh, 411 Blacklisted. Oh, take yeah. a look at those things. And it started, you know, expanding my mind, reaching out to other things. And there are other communities out there, too, um, where the, the BBS scene is uh, originally like the, the, the wares and uh, one-out people were really private. But there are some other groups that really started reaching out socially and, and connecting. Um, I saw, uh, I guess, uh, you know, talking about links you find on uh, bulletin boards to other boards around the system, requiring access to, to get out there codes, uh, figuring out to freak, blue boxing, whatever techniques you need to, to, to reach out there. But the, their communities are building around that time in the mid 80s, uh, early 80s. Uh, there's mind mocks, there, there's the well and whatnot. Uh, there's a system called Diversitals uh, where somebody take an Apple II computer and just load it up with modems, but those people could talk to each other. Uh, that started building up into to other uh, s interconnected systems. I think BitNet uh, was the, the first real major interconnected network uh, other than, you know, like uh, Telenet or, or whatever. That was for a research purpose, but they had a, a a chat program on there where if you had an account on a BitNet computer, you could tell Relay at like CUNY VM or some other uh, system that had a, a Relay host on it. And it would connect you with other people that were trying to talk to Relay. That was the first real chat system I saw on a, on a network system. And then in 1989, Yarko or or I can't pronounce the name, I'm sorry, um, invented IRC and that was internet relay chat. That was based on the, the BitNet uh, client that came before that. So I, I found that really interesting, um, reaching out, talking to people. Uh, I first joined a Plus Wares, I believe, uh, in 1989. And uh, the channels at that time had a plus, not a, a pound symbol in front of them for you know whatever reason. There have been iterations over uh, the years. But uh, yeah, the first person I, I saw so on IRC in November 1989, I think, was Guns. Uh, Guns was a girl from the University of Illinois, uh, Champaign-Urbana, and just a, a, a little shout out.
for that. Um, shortly after that, so yeah, I met a girl first thing on the right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, shortly after that, you know, look at Plus Hack, uh, saw some people on there, but uh, mostly with IRC, I saw there's an opportunity to kind of rebrand myself a little bit too. Was, uh, if you put in a nickname, you're limited to nine characters, and that didn't really fit the, the nicknames that are, you know, still undisclosed to this day. Of, of what I used before that point, but you know, I kind of rebranded myself. He's like, not, I'm not necessarily a wares dude anymore. I'm just a script kitty. That's a lot better. Um, but what I, I saw is there's a, a currency uh, between wares and hack. You could take those codes, you could take those wares, you could take those techniques to get into systems, and you could kind of enable the communities between. So, uh, one of the things I did in the early 90s, I guess, is kind of start creating that bridge between communities. Um, and I did that by uh, creating a, a couple of bots that sat on those channels. Uh, there's HatCat and Where's Cat. And basically they maintain the peace through uh, violence. <laughs> so, um, the, but the, what that did is it set me in a position where uh, IRC was kind of where everybody was popping up. Anybody who was anybody would try to pop up in that area and I would see them come up. So what was interesting is I saw a lot of people, you know, both on the stage and in this room, you know, literally grow up through, through IRC and that was, that was kind of special and this community is really built in a way that back then I didn't really expect. It's just, I look out here, it's just amazing. <laughs> All right, and last but not least, the one and only John Threat. Yo, what's up? I am least. Right, that's kind of you. Uh, one question I have is that, first of all, just before I get started, uh, yo, you guys sure you weren't calling sex lines to run up those bills, man? <laughs> you could tell me, bro. Where is it? <laughs> so, where should I start? All right, what was the question? <laughs> what, what is your origin story? Forgot, <laughs> yeah, like, how did you become a hacker? <laughs> All right, so, uh, yeah, so I'm from Brooklyn, Brownsville. Anybody here from Brooklyn, Brownsville? Okay. Really? It's fucking quiet. Nobody? All right. <laughs> wow. Before we get started, all right, raise your hand if you uh, have broken into a computer before. Who? Yo, what's up? Come on, do it. Nice, this is good. That makes me feel at home. I'm home. All right, so for me, I'm from Brownsville, Brooklyn. Um, my mother worked at a school. Uh, then, uh, yeah, they had computers there and it wasn't any games or anything, so I was just fucking with it, right? There was like an Apple II or something. And yeah, so I was fucking with this thing. And then there was, a, there was this lovely woman, uh, Sheila. Um, um, she lived in Park Slope and her and her partner, she was very cool, she had like a mohawk. And she, and she was like, yo, I want you to come to my house and just code. And then boom, I'd be there. And she'd be like, no games, just code. And I'd just be there and I'd be like, I don't know if this is fun anymore, but that's all I can do. <laughs> fucking code, right? So in a lot of ways, that's like the crucible for me. I was just fucking coding and shit. All that shit didn't even matter. So then uh, uh, eventually I did get a computer and then I did get a modem. I, you know, I. <clears throat> Yeah, I'm not going to say how I got that modem, but you yeah, trust me. <laughs> my uh, mom didn't buy that modem for the Commodore 64. But for me, I only know breaking into systems. That's my shit. That's what I do as a hacker. That's like the, the starting point for me. So initially, yo, that was all I did was just breaking computers. The time I saw a pound hack, I was already breaking into computers. I was like, I don't need this chat shit. Just break in. <laughs> uh, yeah, no, for a long time, actually, on uh, the instructions for IRC, it was like how to do a, a, a ban. Permaban was NetWiz. That was my hacker handle at that time. <laughs> you were the example? I mean, I tore that shit up. So anyway, the, I mean, I was really bad. So, um, but I think that, like, for me, that was like the start. I feel like I was, uh, uh, in a lot of ways, like hacking is magical. One of the reasons I asked you to raise your hands is because if you've ever broken into a system, there, yo, to be honest, that shit is like an orgasm. It's like a tingle goes up your spine. It's unbelievable, the feeling. It's also such a creative 
exercise that a lot of people don't realize it. Now, there's different ways to relate to it. Some people relate to it in a technical sense, and that's fine, but there's also like an art to it and a beauty to it and to exploring and using your imagination as ways to get around in different systems. And a lot of times people don't really think about that. Like for me, and, and maybe I'm going too far, we could talk about this later, but it's the idea that that actually sometimes reflects in security too much where it's like, okay, efficiency, here's a checklist, but the beauty of the attacker or the hacker or whatever you want to call it is using your imagination in a pure form to get around and look at data and not let the world restrict you. You don't think about that. And that was allowing me to have access to computers around the world and look at data that I wasn't going to get at the public at the public library or on fucking, I don't know, what do you got? You guys watch those TV news things? Is that what you guys do? Anybody watch TV news? Yo, don't watch that shit. It's <laughs> terrible. <laughs> so my point is, yo, they're going to just tell you whatever. And I don't mean to make a, I can make a long comment on that, but my main thing is that that was like part of the freedom of the hackers. Like, yo, just pure information, contextualizing it for yourself. And that's like also that rebel spirit that really defines the mythology of the hacker. All right, I'm gonna stop there. Peace. Yeah. All right. There are a couple of threads that came out of all these origin stories that I want to pick up on. The first one, let's just take a hook from what John was telling us uh, about hacking. What were the early techniques? Like, what were you guys doing to make free calls and explore these new communications channels? Or just let your imagination run wild all over the information space. So I, I, if I, I'll start out. Sorry. Yeah. So I assume most people here have seen the movie War Games, right? You know, raise your hand if you haven't seen War Games. Oh yeah. yeah. <laughs> there you go. Now you've got some you got some homework. Um, so I watched that shit. And most of this, most stuff in War Games, you know was not real but there were some both kernels of, of actual practice and technology so you know there's a you know one of the plot points is Matthew Broderick's character um, just sets his computer to call every phone number in an entire area code because he wants to find a system that is what we would do I mean we actually called it war dialing after war after uh, after war games so you set your computer call every phone number in you know 617 overnight you wake up in the morning and you got a list of where a computer answered it doesn't keep a list of how many people you woke up and swore into the phone but um and then you just call each one of these things to see what answer to the other and some might be fax machines some might you know you don't nothing kind of really responds but some do and then you figure out like what is what um so that was like one way we found systems before the internet um oh yours is off wow. Ah, oh, there I am. Uh, no caller ID. No caller ID. So yeah. we could do this all <laughs> night long and not worry. Yeah. And uh, then also, same with like to get uh, phone codes because, you know, ca calling cards, because long distance calling was really fucking expensive, you know, dollars a minute kind of thing, um, as our parents found out. But um, the, uh, so you'd set it, you'd like find a local, uh, you know, the number for like a, a MCI credit card or something, and you'd set your computer, just call it, and basically you're, we were brute forcing. And it, originally, like these calling card codes were like six digits, um, you know, and so you would you would get them really quickly. And again, like, it's actually, like in hindsight, it's kind of surprising that more of us didn't get in trouble for that, but like, I guess they just weren't. Check. It's it's so funny because that's what I was always worried I would get in trouble for, and that's the one thing the feds didn't care about were free yeah. phone calls. <laughs> but we, uh, the way that we would find things very similar, we just uh, eight hundred number scan. Right? We'd go to, to pay phones and just dial manually and listen for weird things picking up. Again, no caller ID. Uh, you wouldn't be traced on an eight hundred number. Uh, and I remember we found something once called, um, and it would be wild if anybody remembers this, it was called TravelNet, run by General Motors. Anybody have any memory of this? Okay. Uh, one, one person. Okay. Uh, it was just some weird system that was actually voice activated. You would speak the codes. And it was, it was two um, sequences of four numbers. Um, and we realized after after getting a whole bunch of these codes that they all added up to the same number. I don't know why that was, never figured that out. But the way we got our first code was by social engineering, by calling General Motors asking, uh, yeah, you know, I'm over in accounting, I need more info on the travel net system. They directed us to a recording that showed people how to use it, and they used a demo code. And I tried the demo code and it fucking worked. <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> I couldn't believe it. And from there, you know, I just mixed the numbers around a little bit and got more codes. Before you knew it, we had 100 codes. And we could call all over the place with that without any fear of, of being um, uh, traced or caught. Uh, the only problem was it would have a beep every now and then. Uh, every couple of minutes it would beep to indicate, I don't know what, uh, time passing by. But that's hard if you're on a modem when that happens. So that was the only disadvantage. But it, it sure was a, a, a gateway. I, th I think you, like, you touched on a, on a good thing when you mentioned social engineering. Because like, as, as today, back then, like... I, the, what I always say is that like the weakest link in any security chain is the human one. And so, you know, we, it would be a matter of like, you know, finding people and convincing people like, yeah, you know, I'm calling, you know, at the time it wasn't IT, but it was like, you know, I'm calling from the phone company or I'm calling from this, I'm calling from that. Like that and dumpster diving to find like phone numbers, to find login information, to find, you know, all kind, like manuals, all kinds of stuff. I mean, that's how, you know, you would learn stuff. And then a lot of times if you, if, Either you would type it up into a text file to share with other people, or if, if you were lucky, other people had already found this, and that's what you're learning, learned from is like, you know, I learned about Cosmos from like manuals that other people, Cosmos was like a, a phone, like the phone company, AT&T's basically phone database where they would set things up, et cetera. And I, I learned about that from a text file. It might have been an LOD technical journal that, that had like a Cosmos manual, but yeah, I mean, that's kind of the way we were learning. Just a quick workaround though with the, you know, yeah, all that stuff with like, caller ID and everything like that. Yo, the workaround with that, when that came out, was it just, yo, you just hack a system and they used a modem on the system to do Global that. outdial. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. So a lot of times you would use like a proxy, which of course is nowadays, that's the bread and butter of, you know, international hacking attacks is to make sure that you have sort of like a proxy. But that was the same thing back then, like early use of like proxies and outdials to mask where you're making the call from and fuck them up. The best is actually when you hack from their computer and then <laughs> <laughs> it's kind of like a Mobius loop a little bit. Another great method we used was something known as extenders. You ever use extenders? Basically, um, uh, you would call, say, a plumber. Uh, after hours, and the phone would uh, forward, uh, using a very crude forwarding method, to an answering service. The answering service would pick up, wanting to take a message for, for Joe the plumber or whatever, and you would uh, wait for them, you wouldn't say anything, they'd eventually hang up, and it would trip down to a dial tone, except it was his dial tone, not yours. So then you could make phone calls from the plumber's phone line. I don't know why I'm picking on this plumber, but you know, <laughs> any, say a used car dealer, anyone who forwarded their number after hours, oftentimes it would trip down to an unrestricted dial tone. And um, yeah, uh, you would never be traced on that. Also, time hasn't been kind to that term because now it sounds like a product at a gas station. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. uh, the, uh, another thing that we do is like, you know, um, for at least to make free voice phone calls, um, was, uh, you know, you use actual piece of hardware. I, either you'd make one yourself, like a, a, a beige box, or you'd acquire something completely legally um, and not off of the back of a phone truck called a lineman's handset or a lineman's butt set, um, which is basically, you know, some people are, some, actually somebody yesterday came up and gave me one for free, which is amazing, because my old one, an ex, left with her. So <laughs> I was, I'm really excited to have it. So it's basically, you know, like a little like phone, phone thing with originally a dial and then later tile and, and just two clips for, uh, you know, the two phone lines and you'd go outside a business or I guess you could do somebody's house or even like a big like phone junction box and just clip on and you'd find a live line, a uh, live phone number and then you could just dial for free. And so for instance, back at the loft, like the, ori the original, original loft, like which was a big industrial building, that's how we would make free phone calls is we'd go back into like into the phone closet and just clip on and just like, call other people, call you, call, you know, our friends and other parts and, you know, then whatever business would get the bill and, and you know, we're <laughs> punk kids. We didn't give a shit. We would get, we would get on our answering machine um, an hour long uh, teleconference recording of, of yeah. a 40 people just all talking at once and uh, why not call 2600's answering machine and uh, and, and then I, we'd, we'd have to wade through all this uh, and then a few weeks later we get a call from Alliance Telecom and said, do you know anybody who uh, might have been calling at this particular time? And What it, was it, really cool, what Eric was just mentioning, um, was uh, Alliance Teleconferences. Those were very popular and just, they, they were like voice chats for groups of uh, 
neuroatypical individuals who found them. Um, but in, in before terms there were in-person cons, we had <laughs> in-person conversations. Yeah, very much so. Um, but uh, in, in terms of just like making calls, uh, the codes were super helpful because you could, you know, set up something to scan them and you know come back in the morning and you got a thousand of them. You could just use them disposably. You can call all over planet Earth because back then that was a significant barrier to entry. I mean, now everything's free. Back then, it's you know as has been mentioned, it's and dollars it per currency. minute. And uh, then, then you discover, oh, hey, I can just actually get into their computer system and download all of their codes, which is a lot more elegant and efficient. And the, the really cool uh, kind of collision of old and new technology happened, uh, for me anyway, in, in New York City, because I had two phone lines, and one was uh, an ESS, which was electronic switching. That was brand new, because they used out of out-of-band signaling. Everything was digital. My other phone line was a crossbar 5, which is a mechanical switch. Everything is uh, in-band, so that means you can trunk lines using 2600 hertz. And uh, there, there's software that was available for computers that would let you generate that. It would pop up a keypad and uh, uh, it has a couple of extra keys. There's like KPST, which is key pulse forward, start, uh, and you know, essentially you're a TSPS operator, which is transit service position switch, if I'm remembering it correctly across decades of time. <laughs> and uh, you're basically an operator and you're invisible and you're inside their network and you can do whatever you want. It's like John mentioned, uh, it's one hell of a dopamine rush. You just killed the final boss on, uh, on that level. Yeah, instead of working in the, the system of numbers, you're attacking the system there. You're working around it with the blue boxes and all the various colored boxes yeah. back then. I, w I was going to, you know, when you're talking about codes, like, you know, you'd get these things and they were they're were basically like currency in the in the hacker world. Like you would trade them. You And so first of all, it was currency in terms of like, OK, I've got this. What have you got? But also it was cred. Like you would be like, hey, you know, you know, you call this BBS and it has all the, you know, all, you know, good codes, you know, basically, and this is like, a lot of this is like where the term zero day, that's used for exploits now, zero day originally was like, where was like freshly cracked things and zero day codes, like they had just been cracked, so you know, it, you know, it's going to be good. So somebody would have all the good, the good codes, then they were, you know, elite. Yeah, or not like anybody rad. Not like anybody would reuse or retrade codes, right? Well, no, no, I mean, they would, but that's like it's yeah, currency, yeah, yeah. you know, like it, yeah. it gets passed around. Yeah, so I'm curious, how did all this evolve, right? I mean, if you go back to these old text files, it's like, here's the list of the default passwords, right, <laughs> for Unix. And like, obviously that, you know, stopped working after a certain point. Um, what, what happened next, right? You get into the 90s, security starts to become a thing. You'd think it would stop working after a certain <laughs> point, but yeah. in actuality, it, it kept on for a long, long time. How many things do you hear about still that it's like, oh, there's a default password that's hard coded somewhere and shit like that? Still happens. Like, we have not, uh, hence again, like, there you go. The old key file is still yeah. useful. There you go. Yeah. Admin, admin. That's true. Yeah, that's that, uh, default passwords still work today. Yeah. It's very nice. Yeah. Um, thank you. Yeah. I think that, uh, but in addition to that, one thing I think, you know, I, you know, that I probably could speak to is that in the evolution of hacking, one of the things that, you know, that I particularly practiced um, is the idea that in a way, you know, the password is the first entrance, but that's like sucking on a baby bottle. You want to graduate to drinking liquor. And the way you do that is you say, yo, I don't need just one password. I'm going to just take the whole password file and you start there. Then that graduates to, yo, I just going to fucking take the whole network. And that idea of like sort of like bringing the lens back to like the larger picture made it very easy to sort of like scale up the, the hacking because once you see it as this thing, like some people will go like, yo, we need ideas out the box, right? Then there's some, some other person and they think they're even smarter. They're like, but there is no box. But to be honest, it's really uh, uh, rhizomatic. Like it's not, it's entire fucking surface of multiple domains. And that idea was, that's, you know, what was able to allow, you know, uh, <clears throat> people that I, you know, interacted with in the hacking sphere 
to be able to break into so many computers. And that, once again, is that that's sort of like the evolution. It went from those ideas of default passwords, getting in, learning it, but then learning to the point where, like I said, it, yo, that the password just became invisible. That's just an individual user. If you could see the whole system and take the system, everything's yours. I, you know, I, John, you, you might be able to talk a little bit more about this because this is, you know, I, I think you have more personal experience uh, than than many of us, you and, and other people in MOD, about like, I mean, you own the phone system and you could you could do things with that that like are still like kind of mythical, like you know, turning people's home phones into pay phones and stuff like that. Sorry, allegedly. <laughs> so maybe you no, can, talk can talk a little about bit about more like owning the system and like what that was like and like, you know, huh. both from a an experiential and like. I don't know, to talk That's around nice that. That's for you to say. I mean, one of the things, thank you, first of all, thank you for that. Um, I probably wasn't going to talk about the magic right. of, of uh, phone hacking. What's interesting is that, that, yo, it is like this hidden network that controls everything. Right now, a lot of it has shifted to the idea about mobile. But, yo, the original phone system that still works is it's amazing in its complexity, so many things came out of those initial uh, engineers who designed the system, but- yo, How robust it is. I mean, like it was literally built to survive nuclear attack. Like yeah. you, in, in, you look around your town of any size and there is gonna be like a hardened building that's, that's the old phone switching office. That's right. And then system, system five actually paved the way for like what everyone uses today. So that idea about the phone system, yo, you could control everything. There was like, you know, you could make service orders, you could change things. Yes, I did. Uh, I love changing people's, uh, uh, <laughs> you want to, yeah, you could turn it into a pay phone. You could, uh, remember, I don't even uh, just, remember. Just if, if people don't know, maybe don't know what a pay phone is, whatever, it means like, you, <laughs> good point. You, you would pick up your phone at home and try to make a call and it would be, please, please insert 25 cents. It's like, a, what? Yeah, I missed that. So then, um, <laughs> But yeah, no, I mean, effectively, it's amazing that, yo, know, there's so many things that we don't think about is control, you know, data passing through these phone systems, both voice and data. So yeah, it was unbelievable in that regard. And then it was always like the, the maybe the, now this is the part that is maybe mythical, but actually already written about is that, uh, you know, the DMS 100 had the famed um, remote headset. Um, um, which, yeah, you could listen in the phone lines, like obviously like Crossbar and the older ones, you had to have a physical tap on the line, but then they were like, oh shit, let's put remote ability to listen in and, and yo, that shit, yeah, probably shouldn't touch that. But anyway. <laughs> it, it never existed, what, John. It was an undocumented wrong? feature. Yeah, yeah, I love undocumented features. <laughs> auto verify. Yeah. To this day, even something dumb, I see a binary, I'll just hit like string on it and just be like, what the fuck's in this motherfucker, just in case. <laughs> but yeah, I think, um, you know, but just to, to, to close that out, the phone system, I think it's interesting because so many, so many people have forgotten about that aspect, that that was like this whole domain that still really does exist. And that includes like the, the complex uh, signaling system seven, which probably I shouldn't mention, but if you do know about it, whoa, it's, it has multiple stratas that control the data in this network. And yeah, uh, probably no one's gonna mention it but me. And I'm done with it, so, all right, thanks. They <laughs> didn't <laughs> yeah. HLRs. Yeah. Word. <laughs> Patrick mentioned something really, really interesting. He said a lot of this stuff is free today. And I just want people to realize that that's all we wanted back then was to make communications free. We fucking won, and we don't seem to realize we did. <laughs> We've... I, I mean, that was part of the thing. It's like, you're like, oh, how can you steal from the phone company? It's like, you're not fucking stealing because you're not taking anything away. Yeah, if like, you're building it back to the phone company. Exactly, yeah. And their, and their profits were, first of all, untaxed, like mm -hmm. Ma Bell, and just, you know, tens of billions. And um, so, and it, we knew, like, it cost them nothing for a long distance phone call. It cost, you know, pennies, right. pennies, and they were charging it. So it's like, you know, fuck you. Like, we're going to take it for free. But all the sprint codes, MCI codes, uh, a travel net, whatever, it was all so that we could connect and talk to each yeah. other. Something we all take for granted now. Community. The other thing, yeah, and, and um, computer access, you know, we all have Linux, uh, you know, on, on our, our laptops. And 
back then, the only way you could on get our televisions, it, on our light everywhere. bulbs, everywhere, yeah, everywhere, everywhere. We all have access to something, but back then, the only way to get access to a Unix system was to either work for the phone company or have an accredited account at a university, which many of us did not have. So breaking in was the only way to learn. Yeah, that, I mean, for me, that was like, I, you know, who's going to get a, a, you know, a 13-year-old kid access to, you know, a Unix system in, in, you know, 1986? And the answer is, hey, nobody. got any words? Sorry. You got any wares? Oh, got you. any wares? Oh, yeah, I'll trade. Hot wares. <laughs> yeah, like a, um, and so it was really, you know, again, I grew up outside of Boston where there's a lot of academia, a lot of, a lot of, uh, you know, tech companies at the time, a lot of defense, you know, probably still a lot of defense industry stuff. So I'm kind of lucky I was doing this in the eighties and not, you know, 10 or 20 years later. Um, but, uh, you know, the, if I wanted to learn about a new computer system, I had to you know, break into it and get access to it to like figure out, you know, to learn about it. And that's what I wanted to do. So Emmanuel brings up a good point about, you know, illustrating the fact that like hacker culture changed so much. It's, it spawned a trillion dollar industry, but it's more than that. Even as you, I look around here, look at this community. There is a special thing. Like I still speak to hackers. I know around the world from every country, um, Sometimes they don't like me because maybe I hacked their country. But yo, <laughs> that's how understanding comes together. But the main thing, hacker culture, it's incredible. So just, could I just t tie it into like the 90s, that 80s and 90s cruxable. So now there were hackers that predated us, right? Tap, blah, blah, blah. I don't know what they listened to. Grateful Dead or Arlo Guthrie. There's nothing wrong with that. I Like a good, you know what I mean? Choctaw Ridge or something. But my point being that 80s and 90s was super special for the acceleration of hacker culture and how much it changed everything. And in that, in that is like, yo, there was like skateboarding running parallel to that. There was expansion of hip hop that went from street music to like the number one music in the entire planet, fucking <laughs> punk music, fucking, and the overlap between punk and hip hop that, that happened in New York all these amazing cultures that are part of the tapestry of our life all coincided with the rise of hacking, all these communities, all these people who develop like rich digital identities to this day. Like I'm sure everybody here, like even the goons, everybody has these alternative names that represents that. But all of that kind of started with the, the anonymous names and the additional pieces and like I said, the things that Manuel mentioned that, you know, in a lot of ways that cause like conversations about free phones. If that's what the consumers want, that's what we're gonna give them. And there's so many examples of how hacker culture has done that. And even to today pushing things like, you know, right of repair or like, you know, or yeah. even the, the GitHub, that nature of like, yo, you know, like I, I, like I have a car thing for instance, you know what I mean? Um, and they shut it down, but like, it doesn't matter. <laughs> yo, the community is going to come together, recode that shit. And yep. you know what I mean? I'm going to turn it into a, like a toilet flusher with music, but that's not the <laughs> point. The point is that that is an outgrowth of all that hacker culture that is embodied here in this room today. So just wanted to mention. I, th I think that's a really good point. Like, uh, especially you mentioned GitHub and I, I, I never thought about it this way, but it is, it is like, you know, the really the embodiment of the old, the hacker ethic of like, you know, you, you, you share information, like you, you, you learn something new and, and now you, you, or you write something new and you share it. And that's like what a public repo is to a lot of degree or like, o or open source, you know, it, it's this like, Hey, I figured out this cool thing. I've made this cool thing. Now you can also use it or, and you can also, you know, change it and make your own thing. Yeah. Let's stick, let's stick with this thread. So everyone here is mentioning community. Right? This is a key thing. You know, there's this profound development of this new information network, the phone system. It's popular. Why? We can talk to each other, right? And people are finding community, especially hackers. So what happens when all this evolves, right? How do we end up at this mega conference with what, like 30,000 people? Okay. How, did all, how did all that start? Well, I think it probably started <laughs> at the very first early, you know, hacker cons, which, like, which, like party con, summer con, like in the very late 80s. Um, I, I think 90s, something like that. Oh, even before that, I think, Tommy, you were at like, weren't you at like one of the first summer cons? Yeah, I was at 91 and 92. I, 91, 92. I grew up in the area, so yeah. I, I had access. At, so that, like we had summer cons that were put on, at that point it was like, you know, maybe people would share a little bit of information, but it was informal. It was basically like you're in the face behind the monitor. You go and like, you know, you go show up at this like motel in St. Louis and there's like 20 other, you know, hacker people. and one of them is Agent Steele, who's a Fed, but um, <laughs> yeah. like, uh, or it was to be fair, actually not a, a not actually a Fed, just an informant. Um, How did you guys not know that? 
I mean, well, he, I mean, he did a lot of legitimate stuff. It, like he, so Agent Steele was this guy, Justin Tanner Peterson, mm. um, who basically, uh, he legitimately was a phone freak who, who had owned uh, the phone company to the extent that he had basically could be caller number whatever for a radio station. So he was winning vacations, he was winning cars, he was winning, you know, he was always like, he was over, always caller 99 or whatever. He eventually got busted for that. So they, he turned state evidence, state's evidence and would show up to these cons and, be, and ask like leading questions like, oh yeah, so what have you been up to recently? Tell me about the, the, you know, the new hacks and stuff. Unfortunately, he also, well, fortunately or unfortunately, he couldn't stop, you know, uh, fucking with shit himself. So he got busted again. And and one of my favorite stories is that so so Justin Justin had he had one leg. Um and when he was when he was busted, the, the news I remember the, the news article was like, oh he was apprehended after a brief foot chase. And I was like <laughs> I I would hope it would be brief. <laughs> well these days he'd really get away. Yeah, yeah. yeah. What technology has done. Oh yeah, yeah. Mm. Oh, sorry. I, 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 sorry. <laughs> That's it. I That's got it. distracted. Sorry. We, we ended up from cons to a fake leg. Yeah, fake leg. <laughs> well, yeah. Um, yeah. So, so I think you know we start out with like these these sort of very informal just meeting up, and then eventually like a kind of more formal like okay, we're going to share information. Cult of the Dead Cow in the in the early '90s had the first you know founded the first um, hacker con where we actually invited journalists and invited like even law enforcement to talk and to come and like meet hackers. Cause there was this understanding that like, there was a, like, we saw that there was a lack of understanding in law enforcement and judicial communities, like as, as sort of Emmanuel alluded to earlier, this demonization of hackers where it's like hacker was synonymous with criminal and not like, not like a cool criminal kind of necessarily, but like, you know, they were like, okay, you know, you, you are, you know, almost like mobster or kind of, kind of thing. Um, but, uh, so, you know, we wanted to, to meet these people and sort of uh, uh, have be able to have conversations and, and it's, you know, it's harder to demonize somebody once you've met them, you know, once you, once you interact with them. And so, um, you know, and then that, that, that DEF CON was founded by Jeff Moss and he, he kind of like carried on that idea with the whole like bringing in uh, explicitly like feds to talk and things like that. And they had, you know, the spot the fed pro contest, et cetera, um, to sort of like make it a game. But it, yeah, I mean, it's, it's- If I can jump in for one yeah, sec, what, what you're saying right there was really interesting because Mindvox had a, a forum that was actually moderated by uh, Kim Clancy, who at the time was a active secret service agent. And the participants were many of the people the Secret Service had just raided in Operation Sun Devil, including Legion of Doom members and a, a collection of other very colorful people. So, so it was a conversation and sometimes slightly psychotic and angry and stuff, but communication was taking place and the people who had arrested, in some cases prosecuted the individuals we're able to sit there and interact with them, talk with them after all this was over and done with and, and try to come to some sort of understanding regarding why this occurred, what had happened. And it was just like super cool because it's like, hey, you're a Secret Service agent. You want to talk to people and understand the whole culture. It was really awesome. I wonder, John, do you do you have like any, any views on this? Because I know like you come out of a, a, a much more... You know, <laughs> you you guys were in the shit, and like you know, and and you know, paid the price to some extent for you know, w from these feds that we're talking like all like oh yeah, you know we're meeting we're we're getting like you know we're being all friendly with, and and you had you know had a bit well, of a I different. I wasn't friends with though. I mean, I didn't really go to cons. I mean, part of it is like yeah, I, you know, I just like breaking a computer. I don't need to go like to a con, but I think you know I yeah I think um I I. All right, could I, I got two things thinking about that though. I don't want to take it too far off track, but one, one thing is interesting in talking about that is, <clears throat> for instance, um, yo, is there, uh, uh, how many people go to ethical hacker con? I mean, like one, right? Two, <laughs> three, oh, no, oh, one. Oh, I thought you meant just a so, ha ethical hacker con. So my con. point being is like, yo, the mythology really lies with the, the idea of the hacker that breaks into stuff and explores things. I think it's funny that they have all these terms, ethical hacker, blah, blah, blah. The white hat, black hat, hat divide. Colors I gotta hate that stuff. Term. You know what I mean? Like, what the fuck? That, you know, me, I like non-binary hats. I don't, that shit's ridiculous when you put things in the box like that. But my point being is that that is, it's, it, it, it goes to like talking about how 
the other thing that I wanted to mention about cons is I also didn't go to them because in a lot of ways it represents like, for instance, and I, and I don't mean to cause trouble. I just want to have a conversation about it. Like, for instance, like a, like a woman didn't wind up on, on this panel, for instance, right? And I have no problem talking about that. I think it's good to have conversations about these things because there were women around. I think I even mentioned that Sheila Averback taught me computers. So but Susan think, Thunder was also around. Susan Thunder, like I think it was mad people, but like at the same, but she wouldn't come to the panel. She, no, it's not her jam. Um, oh. But <laughs> but I think it's. I thought I thought I would just have that just as a part, a partial part of the dialogue because you know women were around during all those periods, but like in a lot of ways, you know, them not being represented on a, a one person that out of all the people not represented also reflects a bit like why I didn't go to cons too much because in a lot of ways, like, yeah, sure. They're like, John, you got voluminous knowledge, but like, yo, it still, it felt like, ooh, like the other, and it's not necessarily ethnicity based. It's also could be like class based or whatever. It just was a different way to navigate. And then, you know, a lot of people would say like, okay, well, um, yeah, they don't have a good concept that like, you know, you don't have to have a, a conspiracy to have conspiracy like effects. But when you set up a thing where there seems to be like an underlying like sort of misogyny in certain languages that you may take people take for granted is norm normal for them actually puts people off or they say like, you know what? Maybe this culture isn't for me, and they walk away. And mm. they, you don't, for the person, they think, oh shit, that was so funny. I'm so fucking Chad. But in reality, yo, they totally made someone's fucking life path curve to something they may really yeah. want to do. I, I think that that's a, a valuable point because, like, you know, we're we're talking about here, and we're we're like talking about like, oh, this this great community and stuff like that. But you know, it's a great community that we were welcomed into. And like, I don't, you know, we can't sugarcoat it. Like, there was a lot of misogyny. There was a lot of sexism. Though fucking a hell of a lot of homophobia, mm -hmm. like just casual, like not, you know, most of it I think wasn't really, you know, vicious. However, you know, you're using terms that make people, people feel un yeah. Un yeah. unwelcome. And unwelcome. And just, you know, just building on that, just a historical point is that one, one hacker that I was cool with, anybody remember Traxter? Oh, uh, speaking of feds or speaking yeah. of narcs. Well, he didn't narc on me. <laughs> 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 So if you don't know, Traxter, he was uh, blind and he also identified as gay. And like, yo, the kids would make fun of him. And I was just like, you're my boy. Yeah. I, and he taught me a lot, too. So one thing I wanted to say is that um, uh, the scene was, I think, more inclusive than a lot of a lot of things that were going on in the 90s, because some of the most successful people from our scene uh, are women. It's true. Um, some of the most success successful people that I know are are women. Heather Adkins and yeah, yeah, yeah Window and Window, yeah, Window Spider, yeah. Lady Ada, Lady Ada, yeah, Lady Ada. I mean, yeah, it was. It, I mean, inclusion. We were, we were. In, I think we were, we were much more inclusive than at least some of the things that were going on there. I I think that's true, but I I also think that like it was, to some extent, like I mean, it, it's been a, it, it, you know, speaking as. You know, I, I can only speak as a straight white man. Like, mm -hmm. um, but like, I, I think that things are getting better, and I think oh, yeah. it's, it's it's gotten gotten better over time. It's obviously I don't, not. I only work with women drink. now, yeah. so it's it's it's. But I, yeah, I, I mean, like CDC was the first group to the first hacker group to sort of mm -hmm. in, induct a, a, a woman member, um, Lady Carolyn. Um, but then you know, and I'm not trying to pat our, ourselves on our back or anything like that because yeah, it no. took us, you know you know, almost 30 years to induct another woman. So it's like, what, what's, what's that, that, you know, and, and, and I'm not, I don't mean to suggest that it w she was any sort of like, you know, a token or anything like that. She was fucking awesome. So that's why we invited her in. But you know, there was this, yeah, it's, I think there's a, a there has been something systemic. Mm -hmm. There's no question that it was, it was um, a different environment back in, in uh, the eighties. Um, early summer cons were almost exclusively straight white males um, who all knew each other. It was uncomfortable because yeah, was if you didn't know them, people. yeah, if you didn't know the, these people, if you weren't in good with them, you were ostracized. Um, and that, that's part of our growing pains, uh, that we eventually uh, started to be more inclusive. But it didn't happen right away. It didn't happen right away. Um, and as soon as the, uh, the kids from the city got involved, 
all of a sudden the media was all over it saying, oh, my God, this is a real, real danger to the average American. You know, you saw the That's difference. True. You saw all kinds of racism, sexism, homophobia. We're not immune from that. We still aren't. But looking around here, looking around uh, what I see at Hope, boy, we've come a long way. I'm proud of this community. I'm proud of what we are trying to do. Uh, but let's just not forget it's a work in progress, and we have to keep trying. Okay, I, I, let's let's come back. Let's I just come want back. To say one thing yeah. that, like, you know, you're talking about when the kids from the city got involved. This is something I was speaking to John about earlier, like about how um, you need the New York scene specific. Like, New York is a very diverse city and stuff. So, like, when you guys, I think, were much more sort of like MOD specifically, like much more sort of like a diverse group than, you know, for certainly CDC or many, many of the LOD, lots of other groups out there. Yeah, we had came out of a different culture. Everybody in there it was really good. I mean, I think anybody seen that movie Hackers? <laughs> <laughs> All right. I only just saw it for the first time. No. Um, <laughs> the other day, they invited me to they, what? The Academy to see wow. it, right? I never saw it. Part of it is that that movie actually kind of steals from it's it's based roughly on on uh on MOD but whatever conversation about it you know what I'm saying like I don't touch that film but I will say I love the diversity in it because it does represent what New York was like both in terms of like gender identity in the film fucking the different ethnicities, even small twist on the dial, like, mm -hmm. you know, like different, like, you know, like uh, even like, I just, I'll just say it like, uh, you know, like there was like Afro Latina as well as Latinos. Like it doesn't like all these like small pieces that for me was like every day in New York city is reflected in that film. So obviously that's why like, you know, I didn't come to cons cause I was like, yo, it's all the, I don't need to go to the cons. You know what I'm saying? And it is, there's fucking hackers in New York that represent all of that. Both, you know, like I said, is is it, but it was also really good for me because it really expanded my boundaries. But you could see where sometimes that might have come up against other people who were like, "Well, I'm just gonna say something out of turn about all these this whole group of people who have feelings and identities and skills, but I'm just gonna dismiss them with one word." And you know, but you know what? Luckily, those days over. <laughs> Most. Of <laughs> yes, All right, never right. happens anymore. <laughs> let, me, let me come back to another really important aspect of the early hacker scene. Um, so here's the next question. How did text files and zines shape hacking culture, and why, perhaps, do they hold relevance for today? I think, I think Patrick, you might have, because, you know, you, you were before... You're older than us in terms of in the scene and like... Yeah, I'm 350. 350. <laughs> but yeah, I mean like LOD, as I said, like from one of my introduction was LOD text files. So like, I, you know, the LOD technical journals. So I don't know if you have a, anything you want to talk about how you guys started... And, and you've written some scene. pretty mind-blowing text files in your day, so... Yeah, I'm, uh, I, I, I write out my, my thoughts and stuff. It, it was, all of it just kind of began as extended rants that were taking place online. The, the whole culture of, of you know, K-Rad, the, the, you know, and instead of using an exclamation point, there's an exclamation point, a one, another exclamation point, a two, a string of zeros, because people actually did that when they were posting like oh, their brand new uploaded cracked software. It was very exciting. Everything was zero day. <laughs> we were mocking things that were really happening and that sort of like metamorphosed into being culture. And we, we wrote about it and we, uh, we, we at, at a certain point in time, you just kind of like step back and you start mocking yourself. It's like, okay. I'm elite. We we have climbed three, one, three, this three, great mountain. We are all together at the top of it, and it's it's all a bunch of bullshit. So what, what what is my name? I, I'm I'm Fluffy Bunny. I'm nobody. <laughs> I'm invisible. Just don't pay any attention to me, and you can tell me how great you are. And 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 all of that sort of filtered down and made its way into the the, the text files. They sort of were uh, pieces of culture and time sort of embedded in, just in a text file that would sort of help you get into the headspace of what it was like at, at that particular intersection point. And right now, you know, 35 years after, I can't enter that headspace like at will. I have to sort of coax myself into it because I haven't been there in a long time. And uh, 
that, 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 that's basically, I'll pass it right back to you. Because uh, that, that group, CDC, I, I, I think it's done a lot of text files. <laughs> yeah, they, yeah. they wrote one or Number two, right? 200 was <laughs> oh, yeah. fucking CDC, awesome. CDC 200, is, is, that's, that's the high point for me. So if you've not read it, uh, that's, that's the way to go. The good starting point. Um, yeah, I mean, CDC started out as like, uh, was founded by, by you know, punk kids in, in Lubbock, Texas, who like, uh, uh, you know, were hanging out in an abandoned slaughterhouse, um, you know, playing heavy metal music and punk and skateboarding and like also just trying to like, you know, they were counterculture sort of things, like trying to, because it was, you know, especially back then, it was very conservative, like socially conservative. Um, and so kind of rebelling against that, but like, and then just, we're gonna write this shit down. And there's a, that, and then also certainly CDC was born out of a like, I, I think this is a thread that runs through Cultivated Cow in general is like this sort of, um, not just anti-establishment, like anti-establishmentness, but uh, also um, kind of like wanting to poke holes in anybody or anything that, that takes itself too seriously. And so we would like write like parodies of hacker files and things like that originally and, and publish them. But uh, I think, you know, as your point, like uh, talking about like KRAD and putting these numbers, I think that's something that come out of text files and come to the hacker community that a lot of people don't understand. Like the whole, you know, whether it's elite speak, you know, 31337 and stuff, that's something that, you know, CDC has said like, hey, you know, we were the ones that first did that or whatever. And uh, other things like now, like things that have entered the, the, the like mainstream consciousness, like owned, like the, as a verb, like, oh, he owned that, or, you know, Pwned. she owns the system, owns, pones, sure, <laughs> that too. But that is directly out of hacking system. You owned a system. Like that's, and now it's just entered the, like it was never a verb in that sense before it, it came out of the hacker. Or scene. doxed. You hear that? Doxed, yeah. on, the, on the news, yeah. you hear news commentators saying he was doxed. Yeah. It's like, what the fuck is happening? Right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> What about the zines, Emmanuel? Do you want to tell us about like the early days of that? Well, it was a beautiful period in the 90s because zines were exploding everywhere. Uh, how many of you remember Tower of Books? I what, do. what a great place. That's what got us started on newsstands was a connection to Tower of Books. And then all the other bookstores, which were around then, independent ones, uh, would also want our zine and a uh, hundred other zines. Uh, then the chains moved in, Borders, Barnes & Noble, and drove them out of business. Then the chains started going out of business. And with them, um, they kind of took a lot of the small independent zines with them because they had no real way to survive. Um, I remember uh, Mike Gundelore's Fact Sheet 5. Anybody ever read that? Yeah. It was the zine of zines. And every issue would be a review of your latest issue. Uh, it was the coolest thing. It was just this um, explosion of creativity. And some of the zines were handwritten, but you could find them in bookstores uh, all over the country. Um, yeah, it's replaced by, um, uh, you know, web pages and blogs and things like that. It's not the same. It's not the same. People still have collections of their zines from the 90s that they will never let go of. Yeah. Um, and I'm, I'm just hoping, you know, I'm seeing more independent bookstores opening these days. I'm hoping to see more printed zines as well because, you know, that, that is just something that you can't replace digitally. There are some stores that, like, especially, like, if you ever go to San Francisco, Silver Sprocket in the Mission or in Chicago, Quimby's, like, are basically stores that, that specialize in zines, like, both sort of, like, you know, comic stuff but also, like, DIY. It's, it's you know, the same, the same stuff. I think yeah. one, one thing you mentioned about, like, the, the idea of, like, uh, the the zine of zines and reviews of things like that ties into text files because one of the other reasons you you would get text files is at the bottom of every text file a lot of times be a list of other elite BBSs like mm -hmm. phone numbers and so you'd find that and like uh, I, you know going back to myself in '86 finding this this uh, this disc like with with text files at the bottom are all these phone numbers and I was like okay like I can call these up and some of them are down because you know some of these things are a couple years up older but some were still up and it's like and then it sort of builds and builds and builds and you, your network you know, social network sort of a um, veggie. Experience. Yeah, I, th I feel like I, this alternative I, media, right, is so crucial. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I will say that the, the very first time that I laughed out loud in front of a computer screen from reading something was, was drunk fucks going to McDonald's and trying <laughs> to order a Big Mac with four patties. A quadro pounder, a yeah. Quadro pounder. <laughs> yeah. Uh, no veggies, don't wrap it, throw it on the Pounder. <laughs> I'll take it like Quattro that. Pounder, bitch. Yeah. Th this is your homework assignment if you're in the audience. Read this text file tonight. It will change your life. <laughs>
All right, I want to do one more question before we open the floor for questions. Where is all this going? Where, where, what is the relevance, especially of these older ideas? I mean, think about what the internet is today, right? It's very corporate, it's centralizing. Um, I think there definitely is a need for fresh voices and alternative media, right? Zines, text files, can this stuff actually come back, right? And have this kind of relevance like it did back in the 80s and 90s. I mean, I, I think it's important to point out that like the, the tech world today is run by and you know the founded by people who are were hackers exactly I mean all, everything from from Steve Wozniak and Steve Jobs who like the way they got the money to to build the first Apple ones was by selling blue boxes you know like and and it you look at how many companies are out there how many big businesses like came out of like people from the hacker scene like it's it's not to be underestimated. How did it get so bland then? <laughs> yeah they all got corrupt. Pe pe people get boring and they want money. <laughs> Yeah, that's part of the issue. Uh, selling out. Yeah. yeah. Well, no, selling I think. Out, right? I think. Well, well, first, I just want. Let me just sideways say that, like another parallel technical culture that grew up with hacking and parallel was EDM. Like EDM matured. I don't know if you guys know, like the Detroit scene, like you know, and connected. I mean, initially uh, uh, influenced by German Germany, which also had an amazing hacking culture to this day. Um, Yo, that ran parallel, but in terms of like where, like in terms of what you're saying, like there's also been a rapid commodification in terms of like security, like in a lot of ways, once again, people think about the mythology of hackers, right? But then it's been commoditized so effectively because yo, you just get your like a life hacking security. and this hacking, right, and that right, hacking. right, 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 right. <laughs> so you, it's so easy to like, sort of like, um, um, uh, yeah, all the channels have been commodified in a way, and that, in a way, suppresses culture because, like, you could just monetize it so fast, and that doesn't give a culture breathing room. Now, I think that culture is still there, evolving and stuff. I see it, but like I said, that is, you know, kind of an end run. And a lot of times when that happens, that's when, like, new shit breaks out or a new kind of thing, like, you know, that, like, hip-hop and punk and EDM, that's all... A, a, a turning point response to, you know what I mean, a change in culture. And even now I feel like there's a change in culture afoot and we'll see that both in film. I watch Skibbity Toilet every day. Like I don't watch that corny fucking movie shit. I think my point being that like you can see the culture turning and in that, you know, we'll see like a new evolution of, uh, of that kind of underground and what form that'll take will be interesting to me. I'll be watching. Yeah, you know, it's um, the way um, the net is evolving now and the concept of creativity, they're not compatible. They're not compatible. Amazon, Google, um, all these massive entities that want to control every single um, uh, ingredient in the whole, uh, the whole process, that's not what being creative is. Um, so something is going to change. I don't have the answer. I don't know what's going to change, but something major has to change if we're going to continue to um, encourage creative people to express themselves using digital technology. Yeah, it, I see it happening myself. I mean, in my practice, you know, one of my practices is, is working as a futurist and with young people. And I run this space in Los Angeles called Rip Space that is like a, it allows like, it's a, ha a hacker, hack tech media place and I have like a, 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 a strong um, community, like I have a bunch of friends in the cyber feminism world who, uh, who curate with me there and I think like you can see the new emergence happening and stuff and, it, and like I said you can see the parts of the culture falling apart like you were saying with the corporate thing there's like the dead internet theory which is not really a theory you see it and media like what you know just as you you see pieces disappearing because once once it's purchased and locked the rights, they could just make it disappear and that's it. You don't have any ephemera, you don't have any physical media, like you were saying, like with the newsletters, like a blog can just, you could turn out the lights, we get to pay the bill, or more importantly, yo, somebody buys GeoCities and it's just gone. They're like, it's not cost effective to run it anymore. And then that saps an entire part of creativity. But that being said, everything's a cycle. That happens, something else will begin to emerge from from the detrius that is from that particular you know in run of corporate it, malfeasance. You come you come back to the whole thing like you know the internet interprets censorship as as you know a problem and routes around it like you know it's the same sort you know the culture will, will interpret like commodification and and control as as an as a 
as a blocker and just route around it. That's yeah, I'll point out, yeah. Culture hacking. Culture, culture, culture hacking. Culture hacking. There you but go. remember, all, all the protocols are open. Yeah. The code is out there. Build an alternative. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Woo. That's All right, your, um, that's your homework assignment. Do we, do Q &A. Let's do a Q&A. Okay. I just want to say first, like we're gonna do, we're gonna open a Q&A, but also um, we have a very limited number. I don't know if actually are any are left of the Cult of the Dead Cow book that are gonna that we have for sale. They're autographed by the author and a member of the C much of the CDC members. Um, money is going. Speaking of building a new network uh, to benefit the Valid Foundation, there's also CDC. 40th anniversary challenge coins and various other stuff over there if anybody's interested that, that we're selling as well as I think there's still some free stickers but there was a feeding frenzy on the stickers. Yeah. <laughs> oh, and also too, before you do the Q&A, you're not gonna show, I got I got a little surprise. Oh wait, wait, there's a surprise. Wait, I gotta go to the end of the, is this the surprise job? I can't see what's on the screen. I, I'm just flipping through all the weird stuff at the end. Yeah, man. I mean, we need a little bit of, we talked about text files. How about some it's real like, hacking? If it's like a, a redacted document. Yeah. Take a look at that. So one of the things. Oh, this is, this is elite. This is yeah. elite. So I don't know if it's on the screen, but. Uh, it's still on the screen. Yeah. Well, why don't you read it real quick? The unredacted parts, just a little bit. Time of meeting, place of meeting, people involved. The purpose of this report is to summarize the meeting that took place between myself and two individuals from the redacted, intelligence redacted. The intent of the meeting was for the redacted to provide MI a comprehensive up-to-date training session on the techniques employed to gather intelligence in this community, the computer underground, ooh. Some of the more specific topics included how to effectively create an alias that would produce favorable results <laughs> in gathering intelligence. <laughs> Agent Steel, good, good, good. What, not good. the death vegetable? <laughs> Buzzwords used by hackers when describing particular items, like wares. Items to be searching for when gathering intelligence from the computer underground. Boxes, maybe? Uh, techniques employed by law enforcement to effectively protect their personal professional profile from compromise by the hackers. Oof. That's a little navel gazing there. Yeah, yeah. Right. Uh, well, this is secure. And then if you just go to the last page. What is this, uh, this letter greetings? Yeah, it's, uh, it's uh, from the mail spool at uh, Mindvox. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Uh, hackers, hacking hackers, uh, he, uh, law he enforcement. Yeah, uh, hacked them. Um, if uh, he said he's gonna nail the person that hacked uh, Mindvox, <laughs> so I don't Patrick, think that happened. Did, did he ever nail him? I'm just curious. Who, 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 who said on, on Mindvox? But Matt, who's Matt the, Cable. the letter from? Oh, oh, it's Matt Redacted. Cable. Oh, Matt Cable. Matt Cable, system administrator. Oh no, no Advanced doubt access he, he technology. probably did not. I think he, he probably did not. Form a, 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 of course, he didn't nail him. Consulting Pearl. It, 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 it's of highly unlikely him. that the <laughs> oh. these are some deep John, cuts, folks. Some very deep cuts. Who's the one who gave you a password and said, "Welcome, have fun"? That's true. <laughs> so uh, but there are a couple mics. So yeah, if you have a question for our panel, anything, even on come on up. Sure, yeah, we got, we got a microphone on each aisle. So if you have a question, we, if we've got like I think about uh, as you can tell, minutes. our panelists love to talk. So <laughs> Sorry, ask anything. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Let's start. Let's start over here on the right. It's a great text file for anyone. Uh, are, are the mics on? Ephemera. Yeah. The the, the <laughs> Q and A mics. Yeah, the Q and A mics need to be on. Okay, try again. Hello? Uh, can you hear me? Okay. Yes. Yep. So, um, it's, um, it's interesting. I've been... I think it needs to be louder. Sorry. Yeah, louder. Hello? There we go. There, there we go. go. Now hey. we're talking. Um, uh, I just wanted to ask you, I, I've been kind of periphery to what you guys have been doing. I've been in the uh, uh, computer networking space since the 70s, but I wanted to ask you about modern hacking, uh, particularly with the... Um, you know, the uh, authoritarian countries like Russia, China, North Korea, kind of coming into the, uh, you know, the hacking space, so to speak. I just want to get your thoughts on that, you know. You mean in terms of, of uh, as nation state actors yeah. or, or people in authoritarian states trying to get access to the, the free internet or? Well, I mean, yeah, it could be that too. I mean, good thoughts <laughs> impacting the culture and, and, you know, what's your perceptions on that whole, that, that is evolution that's occurred. Yeah. Uh, does anybody want to take that first? Um, well, if <laughs> like, one thing I'll say about that is one thing about the hacking community has been really good um, on all sides of the spectrum is the idea to be able to help people in other countries 
freely communicate with other countries because a lot of countries authoritarian sometimes um they want yeah they seek to control the conversation between other countries and definitely people try to relay that with proxies or different tools so that way they can get information out or get information in for whatever purpose that could be just to talk to family or you know if there is you know like i said a change in uh um in uh you know in uh and what the people want from their government. Um, so in that regard, the hacker community has been great. And there's definitely, you know, public organizations you can get involved with. And there's also private ones. But that part is actually a really amazing, you know, smaller, not as well documented in the press, which is probably for the best in a way. Because one thing is definitely nation states like to target reporters quite a bit, which is a, another yeah. very expen uh, expansive topic, actually. But yeah. Somebody from the other side. Next question over here. Um, back in the day, we had like a Commodore, and if the kid messed it up, you could reset it. And later on, we had Windows, and you couldn't mess with it anymore because then dad couldn't do his work and had to get somebody to fix it. And you could explore, and now we've got web pages where you get sued because you vote, viewed the source code of the web page. Uh, hacking used to be fun and educational, and now it's become downright dangerous. Oh, so it was it, always dangerous. <laughs> uh, it, it's, I think it, there was a lot of us back then that we did it even despite it being dangerous, and now a lot of people are afraid to even try. What can we do to help this? Well, you got to get the idiots uh, who think they're in power out of power. I think what you're referring to is the uh, Attorney General in Missouri. Uh, if I have this correct, the Attorney General of Missouri decided that viewing source code of a web page was tantamount to, be, to committing a, a crime. Uh, I think he threatened a reporter with jail time. Look, there are people who don't get technology, who don't get what we're all about. Or they're not interested in getting it, they're just using it as exactly. a and hammer. They, they use fear tactics, they use their own ignorance, and, and think that they can intimidate people. And, you know, hacking has always been about um, saying, you know, we're going to do it anyway. And um, we have to, to stand by each other and, and, and not let ourselves be intimidated. I, I think for me, oh yeah, uh, for me, I view like hacking as inherently uh, anti-authoritarian. Like, like, like if you are breaking into a system, but for me, like hacking means like you're doing something to a system, whether it's a computer system, a cultural system, anything, whether it's Ikea hacking, whatever, you are doing something with a system that it was not intended to, that you were not intended to do. It might be illegal. I mean, IKEA hacking isn't illegal, but it's, you know, you were not that, you're not following the instructions. You're doing it your own way kind of thing. Yeah, it's and, a mindset. Yeah, exactly. Hacking is an individual act. I mean, you know, you can say that nation states use hacking uh, abilities, use hacking skills. Uh, but hackers, as a rule, are individuals. They don't make good soldiers because they ask a lot of questions yeah. and they, they think outside the box yep. and they, they type things that they shouldn't type in, uh, according to the rules. Exactly. So um, something to keep in mind. Make groups then. All right, over here. <laughs> uh, I have a question for the panel. Uh, the, the, the guys that. Could you speak up a little bit? I think. The, the, Hi. Yeah. Uh, I have a question for the panel. You spoke uh, briefly about freaking and, and ISDN and all that kind of cool stuff. Um, I'm super interested in the topic. Uh, what would be a good starting point for me to dive into that that world? 2600 Magazine. Well, that's just one of many. There are so many um, um, books and guides and, and online tutorials. It's hard to point to one specific make thing. Books. Exploding um, the Phone. Yeah, yeah. Lapsley has a oh, yeah. uh, book on this topic. It's it's a um, it's a very long book on the history of freaking called Exploding the Phone by Phil Lapsley. Phone. Yeah, I yeah. think I think it's, it's hacker right. approved. Right. Everybody yeah. loves it. Yeah, check it out. Thank yeah. you. Appreciate it. All right. Level. Oh, there we go. Now we go. Um, back in the day, I loved reading the books about hackers in the '80s and '90s. Uh, I'm curious about commentary from folks who have appeared uh, as semi-fictional characters in unauthorized biographies, Lod Mod Wars, things like that or those who have appeared as a named character in a movie or even have in a book now where they've worked with the author? I mean, uh, I can, speaking you know, from, for the CDC book, the author of whom is hiding behind his notebook right there, <laughs> so then, like, you know, what I always say is it is not the book that, that we would have written about CDC, but we didn't write the fucking book. So, uh, you know, and I think he, he, did, he did write by us. I think, um, l largely speaking, I think, you know, uh, John might have a, a different opinion about the, the, the MOD book. Maybe you can talk about how, what that was for you. Oh, yeah. <laughs> but was there even a, a, a mod Lod war? Did that really happen? Oh, yeah. What? Did that even what, exist? 
Was there a Mod Lod war? Cyber war. That's for a different session. Okay. <laughs> And if you're referring to Emmanuel Goldstein in the, in the film Hackers, that was a joke. But I have a, oh yeah, I, I do have a quick story, so, and, and, and a plug, so I have a, uh, I'm working, I, I rep by uh, uh, Spectrovision, which is Elijah Wood's company, and gonna do, uh, one of the projects I'm gonna do is a Spotify-based uh, um, uh, podcast about hacking and stuff, you know? But one of the stories that's interesting is that this guy wrote a, a um, book a fucking, what's it called? A, a graphic novel. He's a very famous graphic novelist. And he wrote a story and he actually lifted a lot of my story. There's actually another book that, uh, the Hacker Cracker book that that guy stole my story. He said he was a Decepticon from Brooklyn. But yo, yeah, Decepts was over by 2000, brother. I was the only one. Yo, that, why are you stealing my street cred? But yo, this other guy wrote this book, steals part of my story, puts it in there. But then turn around just the other day, unfortunately, he, he committed suicide. Oh my God. And it's just such a bizarre set of circumstances that, like, you know, we're going to have his partner on the show. I, I just can't believe, like, that. Yeah, and, and then, yeah, just some shit happened where he um, wound up accused of um, um, un in inappropriate um, conversations with people who are underage in a sexual manner. And then, you know, and, and he committed suicide. So it was this weird you know, Link. But anyway, I just wanted to tell that story since you had mentioned, like, fictional stuff. And, you know, I see stuff sometimes, like, I'm like, ah, uh, yeah, yo, I don't give a shit. Like, you know what I mean? But sometimes they do, they kind of, yeah, they be stealing my shit a little too much. <laughs> right. in, in a CDC, we have a thing, like, we, we keep track of, like, people who, like, claim they're part of the cult of the cow or whatever, and we, the phrase you use is stolen udder. So, like, stolen udder. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. We, yeah, we, get, we, we keep a list, man. Yeah. All right, next one over here. Uh, so, not so much questions. Oh, Ed, okay. Yeah. Not so much a question or anything. Just wanted to say this is my fourth con, my fourth DEF CON, uh, DEF CON and uh, uh, this is probably my favorite panel in the four DEF CONs that I've All right. Thank you very All much. Right. Well, thank, thank you. Thank you. Nice nice to you. Here. All right, I, you know, I always wonder, like, when I was putting in the proposal for this, I'm like, is this something people give a shit about? Like, it's important to me, it's important to us, but I don't know whether you guys care. Like, I'm... Let me give you a little piece of my history. Uh, I started hacking two to three years before you guys created CDC. And uh, my first, you know, Commodore 64 um, with the modem. Oh. <laughs> I had the little plug-in slide modem. Uh, I, I, I reserved the uh, airline ticket for Michael Jackson to fly and come to my house. <laughs> nice. <laughs> <laughs> One of the first things, I had the, the Casio phone dialer and I used to freak the hell out of my phone there you go. with that so I want to say you know you guys gave me a flashback to the past man I was a beautiful thing thank got the you. book I'm gonna love it reading it thank you for coming I want to hear more from you too I think you got one over here and then yeah I think we're almost out of time right yeah yeah, over here. Well, yep, until here. they kick us off. So until they kick us off. Okay, we're just going to keep but, going. Uh, we're hacking the schedule. We're How are we going to talk about Whoa. the real hacking shit? You guys ready? I, I just only got started. But <laughs> Yeah, I mean, like, we could talk about this shit for fucking days, as you could tell, but... So, I saw a few of you have a title of archivist, or, or part of your, your bios for archi archivist. For those that might be in the audience, like me, who might have archives from the 80s and 90s, all that old crap that we have laying around on floppy disks or printouts or something, is there stuff you're looking for? That is an excellent question. All of it? We, yeah, but absolutely we, all of it. Yeah, you, we should we should chat after. Uh, I, I don't know. I mean, I have Rana Elite 3 discs laying around yeah. from the bulletin board that I ran. I mean, for, my you definitely want to talk to Jason Scott. I was going to talk to Jason yeah. Scott. Uh, Archive.org. I mean, that's that's good for, like, the, the, the media and stuff. I think a bigger question that, you know, we've yeah. been talking about for years is some sort of, like, to find an organization, a university, a museum, or something that would take, create, like, a collection based for the Computer Underground. And I've been talking about, like, the need to do, you know, basically an oral history of the Computer Underground because we're fucking dying, man. Like, literally, like, yeah. you know, three there are three CDC members who've died in the last few years. Um, the founder of Root just passed away last year. And like these are, you know, it's like like the Blade Runner thing, you know, I, these are stories passing away like tears in the tears in the rain. Like, uh, and, and for me, you know, I certainly wouldn't be the person I am if it hadn't been for the hacker community and like coming up through this. And like, so I think this culture is important both personally and because as I was alluding to earlier, it has had a massive impact on, you know, 
outside culture, mm -hmm. you know, yeah. sort of nor normie culture. But if you're looking for a clearinghouse, um, right now, in my opinion, archive.org is doing yeah. the best job. Yeah. And Jason Scott has a real passion for our community. Yeah. And has done he came so out much. Of it. He was he, you know, yeah. the, my, the 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 big hacker board that was a CDC board that I, I was on was the Works in in Boston. You, if you read like Duo Securities, like History of the Loft, like that is where the Loft came together. Yeah. Was on this bulletin board on the Works, and it was founded by Jason Scott. So yeah. you know he doesn't really talk about that stuff, but he was instrumental, like sort of um, by extension, in bringing together a lot of the people who were then instrumental in, in the hacker scene of the 90s. And any remnant of GeoCities that still exist today yeah. is because of him. Yeah. <laughs> so first of all, thank you guys. Uh, you know, growing up with CDC text files and Hope 2001, 2002, um, hugely formative experiences. So thank you guys for this. This is a, this is a big deal for me. Thanks, man. Um, we talked about, you know, hacking has always been dangerous. But, which is true, but you know, back in the day, they didn't really know what to do with us, right? You talked about <laughs> stuff was left unpassworded and whatever. These days, you really run the risk getting in somewhere they're gonna you know, throw the book at you. Um, what are some things you think we can do to kind of give back, you know, uh, provide hosting or something without exposing ourselves to undue risk? Um, and contribute to the de of the- Being people. inclusive is huge. Being inclusive to the people we perceive as enemies because that's the way they understand what we're all about. You know, having people attend conferences like this one, seeing what hacker spirit truly is. Maybe they won't want to lock us up then. Maybe, you know, they'll listen. Maybe they'll reach out to us instead. You know, speaking personally, uh, what I was convicted of, if, if that happened today, I wouldn't be around. You know, there's just no way I was treated fairly. And look what I did, <laughs> you know. <laughs> I annoyed the hell out of uh, uh, the, the powers that be for, for four decades. Um, so, uh, you know, it's, um, if, if you treat people right, if you uh, listen to what they're doing, what they're saying, you'll learn something from them, and that, that works in all directions. I mean, I think that's true, but also, like, there are, you know, as you, things have changed in some ways. Like, there's stuff that I did um, that I'm not going to necessarily talk about that, that uh, you know, I might have gotten, like, at the time, Kind of like a slap on the wrist, or it might have been, a, you know, something that now, now, you know, it wouldn't necessarily be Gitmo, but it would, you know, like, I would not, it would not be a happy experience no. for me if today, if I was busted for stuff that hap that you know, that what the punishment would have been back then. Like, and there are kids whose lives are going to be ruined in the future if we don't change this. Yeah. All right. Well, yeah. let me, yeah. if I could jump in on that real quick, just the idea. One, one thing that I think is interesting is that. That question is interesting. For me, I would say that ultimately it is better to not have fear. You should be not afraid to explore the world around us. I think the first thought is to just think about, I, I like the idea of just blue sky ideation and just being able to explore, which is the heart of the hacker community. When you start erecting too many rules around yourself and guidelines, Yo, you just limit your own creativity. Like I had a class that I taught at university and uh, about hacktivism, and one of the one of the amazing classes was called. Uh, we we I had them ask come up with ideas how to defeat AI just on paper, and they loved the class. It was an amazing fucking class. I would hire all of them for work on a on a on a contract. But my point being is that it's multiple ways to think about ideas. I think what happens is so many people get caught up in, in that. And like I said, they never get a chance to fully explore the, the intellectual, you know, uh, uh, abilities that they have. And that may include exploring and finding new loopholes. Like I said, just even doing it on paper or chat GPT, you know, you could break chat GPT, go poison the model. Maybe I'm saying too much, but the point is, that yo, no one's gonna arrest you for that yet, soon, yeah. but not yet. Well, my <laughs> is, there's so many domains to explore. Um, um, yeah, and I think, you know, you could say be careful, but I also say, yo, sometimes you just gotta get out there and do shit. This is not oh, legal yeah. advice, just <laughs> FYI. But it's good advice. It's good advice. It's good advice. I'm, I'm trying my best. My I'm from Canada. My flipper zero is illegal. But. Uh, yeah. oh. 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 All right, over here. Need the microphone on? Oh, there's nobody here. There's nobody there. Oh, wait, 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 wait. 
Test. Yeah, there we go. Three. You're good. I don't know what to call it, but I'm going to call it the underground Fed side. <laughs> because we did things that weren't approved of by the FBI. Okay? Um, one of them was even coming to DEF CON conferences surreptitiously because we wanted to know how to harden a nationally secure computer, which we'd signed off in blood that we did a good job. But we couldn't get a list of what was vulnerable. Because you yeah, asked the Fed, the FBI, you know, what's the list of vulnerabilities? Where can I get a list of vulnerabilities of an HPUX system or a Sun Microsystem? And they said, the only person uh, on earth who cares about that is criminal. And you're not turning criminal, are you? <laughs> How in the world did I harden such a system? Well, I went places I wasn't supposed to go. <laughs> yeah. Under names, I wasn't supposed to be. Um, I remember 12 of us went to a DEF CON conference very early in the sequence, and I won't list the one. <laughs> And the idea was is that no feds were going to come. We could recognize feds. They had a contest, okay, to try to recognize feds. And uh, if any one of us told on the others under mutual assured destruction, we're going to all turn each other in. <laughs> you get all the t-shirts that way. <laughs> well, yeah. So, so mutual assured destruction of, of our careers was uh, the deal. So we just went off into a side conference and talked about what was vulnerable for systems so we could harden them when we got back. Now, I know even the movie Hidden Figures doesn't cover all the hidden figures I know. There are a lot of ladies that did some really awesome stuff. Okay. Not just the ones they showed. I, I got names and people I met. They were just amazing. Um, one of them did the invention of wing flutter analysis in 1943 because all the engineers went to war. So she was not a Rosie of the River, she was a wing flutter analysis designer. She went into computer programming in the 1960s. Uh, but on the decriminalization of hacking and the whole concept that vulnerability, uncovery, disclosure, express, exploration, uh, cleanup, limitation should be normal and it's okay and it's the idea of what's called what we now call a security researcher right <laughs> so that that's okay that's legal that's fine that's normal um, we uh, we did complaints to the FBI like there was no tomorrow on that one we did we really did um, I got into computer security because of a computing warfare exercise with a toy national top secret on my hard drive. I had to take out all computers, foreign and domestic, to prove that I could move a secret from a top secret computer to merely a secret computer just because I wanted the computer update. Yeah, I mean, I think it's, I think it's fair to say that, like, um, there are Could people. Could you repeat that entire question? For no. <laughs> no, no, no. So actually, sir, can you fill in the blanks in this document I have on the screen? <laughs> oh. Uh, unfortunately, no. I, 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 I spent more time um, spotting feds <laughs> than, uh, than, uh, uh, than attesting to the intelligence of a fed. Sorry. I, I do think, I, you know, you kind of raise a a valid point, which is that there are people working within a system that also need to, to maneuver around the, the strictures of that system. Yes. Yeah. But I, I know that we're almost running out of time, sure. so I want to make sure that, that these guys have a chance to, 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 to get in their questions. All right. Uh, oh, some, another microphone. Okay, great. Thanks. First of all, thank you for all coming out here. I think the person to person Thanks for having is us. very important. Um, so you all grew up, well, you were there when the internet was born, and uh, you all had your uh, really unique ways of thinking about information. Um, and it seems like half of your energy was just getting to that information when it started out. And as you pointed out, now it's, it's free, it's everywhere, but you also have your echo chambers, you have you get you get cred you get you get a uh, you know street cred for being the person who found something etc. So so now you have your your echo chambers you have your uh, algorithmic content you have your uh, machine learning uh, hallucinations 
I just want to get your thoughts on how do you separate fact from fiction now? Mm. Data is everywhere. Uh, well, this, so, speaking as the author read, of in History you of Fake read Things my book, a History of Fake Things on the Internet, available wherever fine books are sold. I mean, it, it, like, there is no one single answer like, or, or specific thing, but it's critical thinking, man. It's like, uh, you know, being able to, being sure to assess everything critically. And, you know, I don't pretend to be a professor of this, but, you know, it's, you know, think about um, what the source is, like where's, where it's coming from, what the motivations might be, et cetera. Like, you know, if other sources are saying oh. the same things, et cetera. And having real in-person conversations. Well, well, yeah, exactly. Well, one thing, one thing that I would say about that is just, a, I think about it like a, a thought problem. We live in an era of like what I would call like an information atmosphere. There's an amazing amount of data out there. You can see every breach gets bigger and bigger and it's so much data to process and there's all these tools. Now in that is this like a, is an amazing moment to figure out new tools and ideas, how to move through this information atmosphere that has enveloped the entire world and us, our personal, our digital selves, um, um, every every complex app or whatever, the web page or fucking piece of media, it has all these different layers of information. So I don't, I, I'm just proposing back to you the idea of like thinking about it that way as a way to like, to tackle it. Cause in a way, in, in some ways, figuring out how to navigate that, not, as an abstract can help you like reorient on what data is real. I mean, in some ways it doesn't, there's so much m misinformation and culture jamming. I don't know how many people are here into culture jamming at all. <laughs> That's a whole other track, but the, but the idea of it, the idea that there's so much voluminous information out there that you can actually get lost in your own data and not able to really concentrate and make sense of your own Thing. There's that term about uh, hyper normalization and the ideas about that, yo, you could actually be overloaded with information and lose yourself. And I think you see that a lot in society, but it's an evolutionary process as we try to figure out how to discern through the information atmosphere what's real and pull that out. And in some ways, it doesn't even matter if it's not real, if you believe it. So that matters. I don't know about that. <laughs> Whoa, yeah, check that film out actually, Hypernormalization by Adam Curtis. It covers like all of this and Masters of Deception are in that film. But we, we have, we got room for one. Yeah, one more, one let's more do one more. And we'll close if, any, if anyone wants to catch up with us afterwards, you know, we'll be around, so yeah. All right, awesome. So uh, I have a comment that leads into a question. So I got my start into computers uh, with an Apple II Plus in the late 80s when my grandfather gave it to me. And thank you. Uh, he and my parents worked very hard to build a level of curiosity of how things worked for me. So I was naturally intrigued. Uh, when I got this, I had, he gave me books of how to write, literally write poker games copying from the book. It wasn't, I mean, it was literally code with comments of this is what it does. They had magazines that they would, you could order that would like Amazing. have people, yeah. Yeah, you don't, I, I can't find that anymore. I've been looking. So, um, my daughter just completed her second bachelor degree in software engineering at 19 and they don't teach that style anymore and it's a it's a lost art i think but uh, uh, you take two hours typing in a program you you're you vested know it. yes <laughs> and you want to know why yeah. every line and every character works the way it mm -hmm. does so uh leading into that i first visited my first dial-up bbs in like 1989 mm -hmm. uh i was like nine years old with my apple II plus <laughs> Moving forward, and uh, we, we are being rushed off. Yeah, we're being rushed off. I know the the goons are like yeah, we're getting rushed off. Because we're over. Getting, so, but, yeah, no, no, I'll be quick. So in uh, uh, 1994, I started actively going to dial up BBSs. All of you became legends to me as I was looking Thank at you. text files. But looking at that, and with my daughter coming up, she's 19. Her friends, other people. How would you suggest to build that in the same nostalgic learning experience for the next generation, so that they're mentally, emotionally spiritually engaged into tech who's who's her hero who does she look up to i don't know it's, <laughs> I, I me. mean if, if you can make a connection there you know find a role model and you know kind of push towards that i mean i i i'm on stage with a lot of people that i consider role models and you know i'm i'm honored to be here so these are the people i look to it's like find that 
person, I guess, who, who can, you know, light up the path. I, I can't necessarily suggest that, but, you know, listen to her and, and her interests. Yeah. Right. I was looking at the overall younger community, you know, because when I was growing up, I, like you talked about, we had dial up BBS. We had to search. We had to go. It was an active search, which engaged at a different level. You know, the only thing, and someone recommended this to me recently, is tour. Not necessarily the most hospitable place to go, but you have to go on a search and a hunt to actually find things you want. Sometimes there is actually fun, creative, artistic sites, other things. But is there, do you have any ideas or maybe you could put, you know, if this idea sinks in, post and share some ideas. Because I've noticed kids are very interested in learning about things like old cameras, old computers, things that they can get their hands on, things they can take apart, things they can break and fix. Answer their questions, encourage them, give them books, uh, take them to uh, uh, vintage computer um, uh, festivals or, or whatnot. Something um, kids like phys rebels. Yeah, physical. Yeah, that's true. Hacker spaces, maker spaces. All right. Yeah, great. Yep. We're going to leave it there, folks. You were an awesome audience. Thank you. Thank you for everybody stuck around. You know, thanks. Man, that was awesome.